Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Please remain standing for the invitation, which will be given this morning by Angus McDonald. Heavenly Father, we implore you, if it be your will, that you not reenact the, the Noah drama for the next couple of hours. We, as the sons and daughters of Abraham and Sarah, are heirs to the blessings given those wandering and often lost in our maids. The class of 2012 has also wandered in the sacks of Lewis Hall late night. It has often been lost in the complexities of the Internal Revenue Code and recent case law under 12b6. There were times when it seemed impossible, and yet we are here today. What could have seemed more impossible nearly three years ago? Perhaps the word that Sarah, when she was well on the other side of 90, was pregnant. Her response to that surprise was laughter, and laughter and celebration are not inappropriate responses to the class of 2012 on this day. But we pray that beyond the laughter and the rejoicing this day, you who will graduate will remember that as the progeny of Abraham and Sarah, you have been blessed so that you may be a blessing. We pray that you will use your vocational gifts to stand with those who have been rejected by the world. We pray that you will use those gifts to bring light to the folks who live in the hungering darkness and to drive back that darkness so that all of God's children can live and laugh in a world marked by justice. Amen. Please be seated. The members of the class of 2012 faculty and staff, distinguished guests and families, trustees Gray, Ross, Barton, Miller, and Emeritus Trustee Marilyn, friends of the university. We gather this morning in celebration, reflection upon the days we shared together, anticipation of what lies ahead, and relief that exams, grades, and tuition bills are finally behind you. Yet surely there is a suspicion lurking among some of you, a suspicion that is best not to dwell on this morning, that there will be days ahead when you find yourself looking back wistfully on torts and contracts and the friendly confines of Lewis Hall. And you'll find yourselves marveling at how your professors actually made it all so interesting and thinking that the quest for a good grade was so much more civilized than the quest for billable hours. And that the order, orderliness of daily life across the ravine compares favorably to the somewhat disorderly world of legal life. Before we get too far into the formalities of the ceremony, I have a request for the graduates from the class of 2012. Take one last look around at the graceful setting in which we find, in which we find ourselves this morning one of the most beautiful in all of higher education. Thankful that the weather has allowed us to be outside for the moment. And, and actually, while I'm on that, I should let you know that we are uh, closely looking at the weather as it you know, moves towards us and away from us, hopefully. And we do have contingency plans. I'm not going to go through them right now. But uh, barring any massive uh, downpour, lightning strikes, and thunder, uh, we're going to proceed. And this is kind of like the baseball call that we're, uh, we're watching. So as you look around, take note also of the people who have gathered here today. Parents, spouses, partners, children, friends, and faculty and staff. They couldn't be prouder. They have sacrificed on your behalf, and you are surely filled with gratitude. But today is your day, and our pride comes to knowing that someone we care about has, after much hard work, achieved the goal and fulfilled the dream. It is fitting that we also take note of others who made this possible. This is the 163rd year of the School of Law. Throughout these last three years, you have been part of a long and storied history. It was in the aftermath of the Civil War that the Lexington School of Law 
was incorporated into what was then Washington College. For many years, it occupied the building at the far end of the colonnade behind Hoot's Year Lake. First, in one of the ugliest structures that ever constructed in the South, a building that fortunately burned down one night when no one was there, and then in the building that is now at Tucker Hall. A future Supreme Court Justice was educated there, as were several future presidents of the American Bar, many distinguished jurists, and many of the most prominent members of your profession. Over time, the school developed its own distinctive culture. Washington and Lee produced graduates known for professionalism and competence, for understanding not only the intricate details of the law, but also the deepest ethical responsibilities that imposed this upon them. Our graduates would leave here with the ability to see justice, to be sure. But they would have something more, a deep understanding of the meaning of justice and the moral fortitude to commit to a cause greater than the self. As we congratulate you, we charge you with fulfilling your duties. We know that you will meet them and exceed the very high standards of those who came before you. And we wish you the very best. Your time across the ravine has been an interesting one for the profession and for legal education. Washington Arena has been at the forefront of the national discussions, and I suspect that the conversations you have been a part of prepared you well in ways you may not fully realize this yet for the dynamic years ahead in the profession. Interim Dean Mark Greenwald and his colleagues on the faculty have courageously undertaken the exciting but somewhat intimidating challenge of revitalizing law school curricula here and in law schools throughout the country. For the last two years, Dean Greenwald has served as well as the Interim Dean with gratitude for his steady hand and his benign and compassionate leadership throughout this complicated time. I now recognize Mark Greenwald, Interim Dean of the School of Law. Thank you, President Ocean, and good morning. I first extend my welcome and express my thanks on behalf of myself, our faculty, and our graduates, to all of our guests, to all of the family members and friends of our graduates, for all the support, encouragement, and love you have extended to them. On this weekend, over the past three years, and throughout their lives. This is a wonderful occasion for many reasons. One of the most important of which is that each guest here has been a part of our graduates' successes. The very success that brings them to this moment. You share in their triumph and celebration because you were with them and supported them along the path they followed. And it will be their good fortune to have you along as they continue their journey through life. And to you, our graduates, I thank you also for all you have contributed to Washington and Lee as you pursued your degrees. You've worked long and hard. And it's never ceased to amaze me just how much we were able to get you to do by offering you a slice of Domino's pizza. I must say, however, that I observed some worried looks as President Rizzio's introduction reminded you that I am interested. I suspect some of you may have suddenly thought, if this guy confers my degree on me, uh, will it still be good next year? Or maybe some of you thought that the interim dean signed a promise with disappearing in. I can assure you that neither is true. Your degrees will stand the test of time. They have Washington and Lee law degrees for over 160 years. 
As alumni, you also can look forward to getting to know our outstanding new dean, Nora Demleitner, who will take office on July 1. There are, I know, many things that you share as graduates of WNL Law, not the least of which is the extraordinary sense of community that has surrounded your education here. Certainly a community of learning, but also one with personal and social dimensions that are practically unheard of at other law schools. A community of learning that is supported and nurtured by a faculty of teachers, scholars, unsurpassed in their commitment to you, their students. And a community that thrives with the assistance of a tremendously skilled and dedicated professional staff. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, a community in which you work with your extraordinarily able and engaged classmates who have become your professional colleagues and with whom you will remain connected or reconnect in the future in ways you might not now imagine based on your shared experiences at Washington and Lee. You also represent a first to the law school. As you know, you will be the first law class to have graduated in which each member has completed our innovative third year program. While being first in that sense is a distinction that applies to you as a class, the far more meaningful observation is that each of you had the opportunity to take important steps in law school that put you much closer to the professional world that you are about to enter. Before you reached the third year, of course, we gave you many interesting and valuable opportunities to learn in which you work together. For example, in that fascinating, though often puzzling force, whose full name we dare not speak, APLP. And we also gave you many other opportunities, the opportunity to take lots of exams. But when the fall semester of the past year rolled around, each of you again, all together now as third year students, for two weeks stepped into the shoes of a litigator and tried them on for size, polished them up a bit, and assessed the experience in terms of how they might fit in the profession that lies ahead for you. Then, passing over the experience you had in the remaining 12 weeks of the fall semester, we arrived at the first two weeks of the spring semester, and you each, again together, stepped into the shoes of a transactional world. For some of you, they fit better than the fall students and gave you a sense of professional walking comfort. But for others of you, you may have felt that you were developing blisters. Whichever the case, each of you walked forward, gained a real understanding of the complex professional roles lawyers play, gained confidence not from having mastered the roles that take years of practice to perfect, but from having experienced the process, and gained, perhaps most importantly, a beginning sense of what it means to exercise professional judgment. You've gained these things as part of a structured educational process. However, you now take them into a somewhat unruly professional world, a world in which opportunities to show your stuff are not as plentiful as they want for A world in which the first step on the professional path may not yet be clear. And even if it is clear, uh, it is most unlikely to be your life. The speed of change all around us and in the legal profession as well means that each day you will be building upon what you have learned here to further develop the professional skills and standards that you have started to form. It would be nice if I could say to you the ground on which you will walk is more stable 
than I know it is. But change can be exciting and rewarding. Most importantly, you have the core of what you need. You now have an extraordinarily good legal education, a practice commitment to values that are fundamental in life, and a body of colleagues, mentors, family, and friends who care about you and your future. But also keep in mind that to acknowledge some possible unclarity in your future professional path is not to disregard the deeply and firmly rooted traditions and values of our profession, a commitment to public service, a respect for human dignity, and a never-ending quest for justice. It is these values and traditions that we, the faculty who have had the honor and pleasure of serving you, trust you will uphold through the series of learning experiences that will ultimately become the sum of your professional life. I now ask the members of the law class of 2012 to rise. Mr. President, I have the honor to present 129 candidates for the Juris Doctor degree. They have been examined by the faculty and approved by the Board of Trustees. They are to be congratulated on their command of the ways by which justice is attained and commended for their exceptional learning to the advancement of a just social order. I ask by your official act to confer upon them their degree. Upon the recommendation of the faculty and approval by the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer the degree of Juris Doctor at Washington and Lee University. Please come forward to receive the diploma if your names are called. And I ask that the audience hold its applause until the last graduate has received his or her diploma. Thank you. Christopher Michael Alexion. Samuel Farrell Allman. Kristen Adele and Sweeney. Raina Rosita Atkins. Chad Michael Ehlers. Matthew David Baker. Patrick Alfred Bartle. Kelsey Marie Bachman. James C. Fady Spector. John Patrick Becker. Jonathan Curtis Becker. Amber Christina Boyd. William Seaton Bridges in Abstentia. Heather Ann Bridges. Ariel Castle Brio.
Nicholas Stanhope Brooks. Tyler Webb Brown. Rudolph John Burkman. John Tyler Bertard. Brian Edward Celebrate and thank you. Kevin Patrick Carter. Sarah J. Thor. Tahoon Peter Thor. Lauren Ruth Stein. Mark Edward Christian. Jennifer Grace Dean. Gerardo Manuel Delgado. Amanda Nicole Dufresne. Donald Cameron Duncan III. Caitlin Jean Eichner. Nadeen Faramon. Claire Marie Fernandez. Anthony G. Flynn, Jr. Cameron O. Flynn. Christopher Grace Ford. Avalon. Jonah Frey. Susanna Majerski Fault. Coral Elise Fusselman. Andrew Dane Garrett. Jordan B. Gerstner. Benjamin Alexander Gilmore. Ashley Monique Green. Stephen Mar Harkin. Stephen Gregory Harper. William Henry Harrison IV.
My phone is saying you fart, but it's very dark. Okay. So we're moving. Okay. 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 Laura Marie Hudson, Hawkins, excuse me. Ross Leonard Page. John Richard Kevin. Michael H. Hill. Edward Shelton Hillenbrand. Megan Elaine Hobbs. Marilee W. Hume. Matthew C.J. N. Daniel Jason Isaac Smith. Hannah Marie Jamar. Helena Leanne Jetsinia. Brittany. Mia Jenkins. Jordan Elizabeth Jones. Elizabeth Aretta Peterbach. Parker David Kasman. Stuart Alexander Keith. Francis Kirby. Dad, Daniel Clay. Anna Connect. Leona Krasner. Andrew Peter Larson. Tyler Stem Blackenhout. Alexandria Dawn Lay. Kelly Ann Layton. Joy Yunji Lee. Todd Aaron Levy.
Jonathan Randall Little. Dan Lockyer. Robert Bruce Lower. Ashley Ann McDermott. Bobby Ray Martin. Vidal Carlos Morales. Mallory Adrian McRae. Benjamin Farrar McDearman. Lauren Nicole Newman. Angela Faith Merlin. Christopher Edward Miller. James Wyatt Moore. Jill Beth Mark. Ray Deanna Muller. John Charles Nixon. The last, Simone Owen. Suzanne Elizabeth Peters. Keegan Joe Peterson. Elizabeth Adair Teddy. Nathan David Twiston. Richard Willard Porter Jr. Brian Christopher Powell. Ellis Harris Kretler. Alexandra L. Price. Matthew David Rasmussen. Sarah Cotton Rapsel. Mary Caitlin Ray.
William Lane Reynolds. Justin Lamar Richardson. John Thomas Robertson. Mary Catherine Rother. Harden Harrister Rowley. Marie Constance Stefferly. Matthew Paul Schreiber. John Hampton Scully. Christine Michelle Shepherd. Zachary Allen Simmons. Emerald Grace Smith. Jody Elizabeth Smith. Brandon Andrew Spivey. Catherine Christine Fragan. Kristen Louise Stewart. Elizabeth K. Stenson. Mallory A. Sullivan. Jacob Lester Triolo. John David Turpin Jr. Zane Ridnour Tweed in absentia. William Emery Underwood. Mary Catherine Vignes. Michael Williams Warner. Anthony Watson. Aaron Leonard Wells. Mar Marcina Lynn Winterstreet. Gibson Sinclair Wright.
Elizabeth Louise Zamorski. Mark Joseph Zapala in absentia. Marianne Zawadzki. And Christopher Thomas Zona. There are ponchos under the seat of the privileged few that is the students and the faculty. Uh, bring up the umbrellas. We're going we're gonna to move forward. I now have the distinct honor to introduce to you a commencement speaker, Linda Klein. But it's not only an honor for me, it's a special pleasure because Ms. Klein is a former student of mine. She has risen so far and so high in the legal profession, however, that it would be sheer conceit for me or any of us here who also knew her when she was a student to take any credit for her success. But I assure you that we take a great deal of pride in it. Ms. Klein received her law degree from Washington degree in 1983, her Bachelor of Arts degree from Union College in 1980. She was always on a fast track. She graduated from high school when she was 16, Union College when she was 20, and to law school here when she was 23 years old. She credits her parents. Her father was in construction, her mother, a homemaker, with instilling in her the need to bring a sharp focus to attaining goals. Today, Ms. Klein is managing shareholder of the Georgia offices of Baker Donaldson, Beerman, Caldwell, and Berkowitz, with offices in five states, the District of Columbia, and London. Her practice concentrates on litigation, alternative dispute resolution, and counseling business owners. Ms. Klein is not only a past president of the State Bar of Georgia, she is also the first woman to have held the position of president. She is committed to increasing access to legal services for Georgia's indigents. She devised and executed the plan to achieve the first state appropriation of tax dollars to support legal services. She is vice president of the Georgia Supreme Court Commission on Access to Justice, and she is a member of the Supreme Court Commission on Civil Justice. Ms. Klein has also worked to ensure judicial excellence and has served as co-chair of the State Judicial Evaluation Committee, a member of the State Judicial Nominating Committee, and a member of a committee to advise on the filling of federal judicial vacancies. She has held leadership positions in the Atlanta Legal Aid Society, the Atlanta Bar Association, the Georgia Association of Women Lawyers, and is the founder as well as a member of the Georgia chapter of the National Asian Pacific Bar Association, the Gate City Bar, and the Georgia Association of Black Women Attorneys. When lawyers working opposite from you in the profession have praise for you and your work, it's particularly meaningful. A distinguished national trial lawyer recently said of Ms. Klein, she's probably one of the most powerful women lawyers in the country. She can take a complicated situation and break it down quickly, and then relate it to relate it to a layperson can understand. She has an uncanny ability to process information. All her many talents and leadership experiences have led her to serving today as the chair of the American Bar Association House of Delegates, a position of extraordinary distinction. The ABA, ABA House of Delegates is the policy-making body of the largest volunteer membership professional organization in the world. 
The House of Delegates includes more than 550 members and meets twice each year to set association policies on issues ranging from service to the legal profession to national policy related to law. The chair, Ms. Klein, presides over meetings with the House of Delegates for a two-year term that began in February 2011. Even before becoming chair, Ms. Klein had been a leader in a range of ABA positions, and chairing a section devoted to the substantive law of tort trials and insurance and the Association's Coalition for Justice, to chairing the Association's Committee on Rules and Calendar and Membership on the Standing Committee on the Delivery of Legal Services, which tries to increase access to legal services for persons in every income group. Undoubtedly, we expect even greater things from this time in the future. But today, we are very grateful that she has joined us as commencement speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Grunewald, for that very generous introduction. I very much appreciate it. Um, but you did remind me of my favorite introduction. It was when Jack Kemp was running for president, and a local politician introduced him with this most incredibly profound statement. He said, I support Jack Kemp because he is a man who believes the future is ahead of us. We're all glad the future is not behind us. Indeed, we're all glad that law school exams are behind us. And I still have that recurring nightmare that I missed an exam and didn't get to graduate. But I guess this truth I did. Well, imagine the year is 1912. That's 100 years ago. And the question being debated is whether to admit women to the legal profession. And this is what you're hearing. It is alarming to think of admitting women to the bar. It will ruin the relations between the sexes. Where a man found the thrilling touch, the object of his adoration, the ideal of his romantic love, how destructive will it be to discover that her bosom conceals a demur, her colonnade a plea, and in her silken hose is a subpoena Jesus keeping. Indeed, if a woman is ever brought, born with proclivities to the law, she should marry a lawyer and load the cannon so he can be the student. That was part of the debate on admitting women to the Georgia Bar the 100 years ago next month, and the motion to admit women failed by a vote of two to one. The choice that the Bar made 100 years ago was a very bad choice. It was bad for the profession. And while this could very well become a talk about how far we've come in a hundred years and how these are the good old days, I'm not going to kid you. These aren't easy times for new lawyers, and particularly not uh, for the youngest graduates. Uh, I know you've been reading about the recession, you've been reading about it on the internet and in blogs, and maybe some of you out there are out there texting about it right now. But instead, it's going to be a talk about choices, about making good choices in tough times. Now, one of the best choices you ever made is sitting right here today, and you chose to become a lawyer. And I promise you that's true, even if you find yourself doubting it someday. The law is vital, and everyone needs access to the law. Indeed, knowing the law is how we make the right choice. You know, we stop at the red light, we go at the green, and that's the law. And in the old days, the law was only available to those with access to a law library and the knowledge to use it. But now, the Internet makes the law library accessible to all. But it doesn't mean that those without the benefit of our training can use the information that they find. Them. And that's where you come in. Because you can take the knowledge you have and the easy access to information and choose to make a difference for so many. Tough times are tougher times for those who are less fortunate. 
My colleagues choose to spend time at a homeless men's shelter, and they bring law to those who need it the most. The first day there, they were amazed that they could help a dozen homeless veterans get ID cards so that they could get VA benefits. Twelve veterans came off the street into housing and got medical care because a lawyer helped them get an ID card. What a difference a lawyer made. We can do this. You can do this. Three months after I became a member of the bar, I accepted my first pro bono case. Candidly, in those days, most lawyers weren't as informed about the importance of pro bono work. My law firm, no law firms generally didn't give credit for pro bono work. So I took the pro bono case in addition to my other work, and I helped a disabled widow collect life insurance benefits from her late husband's policy. Mrs. M was so disabled that she will never know and would never know how I helped her get the money she needed at the end of her life. But I will never forget her and the choice I made to help her. And we can do this for others. You can do this for others. And I promise you, you'll love doing this. Sometimes making a good choice requires some research. You've all learned that. Uh, you were assigned a problem here at law school, and you did the research to solve it. And when you were unsure of a choice, you had the ability to do the research and find the answer. Well, one day, a widower came to see me. And his wife had been camping with his young son at a public campground. And a tree fell that night and killed his wife. Three lawyers refused to take that case. They told him he had no case. Sovereign immunity, they said. I know you learned about that here, too. And I just couldn't get the thought of those little boys out of my mind. And it took me hours and hours, and I did a lot of research, and I found what I thought was a legal remedy for the family. I put my theory into a letter to the private company that leased the campground from the city. And in response to my letter came a brief negotiation and a big settlement check. And it became a joke at the office. You know, the young lawyer writes a letter and gets a big check. But that wasn't the case at all. I chose to work hard. And the harder I work, the luckier I got. You know, you've heard that expression, but it's true. And you know what hard work is because you survived this law school. And, and don't stop now. Do your best on every assignment, pro bono cases, small cases, your clients, the clients of your colleagues. Just always do your best. The problem you're solving is the most important thing to your clients. When you sign, uh, both the profession will sign, you will sign. It's human nature when people remember uh, specifically the bad things more than the good. But if you do good, I assure you the good impressions will follow you forever. They probably won't remember specifically the cases or what's associated with those good feelings, but the good feelings are going to stick with you forever. Your reputation, our profession's reputation, the whole community it could be at stake. Because once your reputation is lost, it's nearly impossible to find it again. And this brings me to the bad choices. When times are tough, there are legions of people who are eager to take advantage of you. They'll tempt you with easy wins, easy promotions, easy money, and perhaps it will come when you need it the most. And what they'll ask of you is going to seem so simple, yet really lucrative. And how many times have you heard, if it's too good to be true, it's probably not true. And every day in law practice, you're going to have the opportunity to make a bad choice. But making the good choice is harder at first, but in the long run, it's easier. And when you make a good choice, you're not going to have the stress associated with the regret and the guilt that's going to follow you. I know a lawyer who was very well respected in his hometown, and after his divorce, the bills started piling up, and he borrowed money from his client test account. And he did this for years until, like a small town Bernie Madoff, he couldn't get enough money to come in to replenish the money that he borrowed. And at his sentencing, he told the judge that what started out as a one-day loan became years ravaged by fear and guilt, and he couldn't sleep, and he became physically ill. And now he's disbarred in the streets in prison. And I know that no one here is ever going to do something criminal like that. Indeed, when you hear disappointing stories, hold your head high, because you have training from a school that values ethical behavior as a threshold to scholarship. 
You're now part of a profession that constantly studies ethics and professionalism, always searching for ways to improve. Each of us benefits from the training we receive here because we know how to make a good choice. But there are lots of, uh, lots of difficult choices you're going to face every day. For example, one day your most important client is going to ask you to do something that isn't wrong, but it isn't right either. And maybe the choice is to take advantage of uh, somebody's personal hardship by asking painful questions at a deposition when they aren't necessary to prove your case, or not agreeing to a brief extension of time when you know any judge would grant it. Choose to follow your instinct and your training. Always give your client the independent legal advice that all clients deserve, whether they want it or not. And when they don't want it, it's probably when they need it the most. You're the professional. I just saw you get rid of it. You're the professional. So choose to follow the golden rule. Don't strive to be the meanest lawyer. And when you come across someone who does, pity that lawyer and don't sink to that low level. Professionalism, as part of a lawyer's education, is relatively recent, but it's always been a part of the tradition at our school. And you act on behalf of all of us. Because our culture is too precious to sacrifice. I can't pass on the idea of professionalism without saying something that's likely going to be controversial, particularly to our graduates. And that is, choose to look the part. Some law firms are business casual all day, every day, and it's tempting to dress casually. However, I recall when my youngest law partner was mistaken for the maintenance man on one casual Friday. And this proves to me that as a young lawyer, you're going to gain infinitely more credibility if you look like a lawyer, what people think a lawyer looks like. And last week, I met the Chief Justice of Nigeria, and she said, you know, you only have one chance to make a first impression. Just right. Now, there are some people about whom you don't worry about a first impression because they've been your colleagues for three years, and those are your classmates. A recent graduate told me the practice of law is hard, but boy, the close friendships that we develop at the palms and on the softball team and spending late hours in, in the stack studying, that proves to be invaluable. And don't forget that Washington Lee is a network of folks with shared experiences who want to see you succeed. Need a mentor? Think of a classmate. Moving to a new place? Contact the alumni there. You'll soon learn that one big asset we have are all the Washington and Lee graduates out there, and that's something that's unique for all of us. Now, there's another asset that I didn't have when I went to school here, and that's the new third-year curriculum. It's very impressive, and it really gives you an advantage as you begin your career. Early in my career, one of the best choices I made was to get involved in the Bar Association. At the first meeting of the Council of Younger Lawyers, the group's president was handing out the assignments for the year. And we were all looking down, we were avoiding eye contact when he was about to give out the most boring job. It was a job that absolutely nobody wanted. And then when he said, and Linda will do, well, it, it's really too boring to tell you what it was, but I was disappointed to get the job nobody wanted. I accepted the boring job, I did it well, a magazine published the fruits of my labor. The magazine article caught the attention of the big state bar committee that was studying the topic. The chair retired and recommended that I replace him. He then recommended that I offer for his, for his seat on the board of governors of the state bar. And a few years later, I became president of the state bar. And I believe that's because I accepted the job nobody wanted, and I did it well. Some of the most fun I've had as a lawyer has been getting to know and work with my colleagues in the American Bar Association and other bar associations. My rock star idol, past president Robert Gray, uh, my dear friend Stacey Giles are here today, and they're such special friends and colleagues. And those of you who've been active in the student bar and in the ABA Law Student Division and other student organizations, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Involvement in the bar broadens your experiences, it broadens your network, it broadens your understanding of your practice of law. Bar involvement supports the profession's ability to advocate for ethics, for professionalism, providing legal services for those who need it most, and the other values that define us. 
And when the volunteer work and the meetings are done, there is nothing more fun than socializing with your peers and your family. So choose to get back to your profession by active participation in the Bar Association. I recently learned that Justice Scalia was chair of the administrative law section of the American Bar Association, and Justice Breyer was on his way to be chair when he was tapped for the U.S. Supreme Court. And reflecting on the Supreme Court, I was going to use the court as an example of how diverse our profession and our court has become. I thought we now have three women in the court, including a Latina woman. You know, what a diverse court this is. But I studied further. Every one of the justices went to either Harvard or Yale. That's not a diverse court. How could a court be diverse without at least one graduate of Washington League? Thing? But this does make my point more important. I ask you to choose to embrace diversity. I look out at your faces and I see that our school has embraced diversity even more than when I was a student. And solving legal problems requires creative ideas, especially in today's tough times. Studies prove that a diverse group is much better at creative problem solving than a homogeneous group. Diversity changes our thought process. Diversity changes our perspective. Diversity improves upon the choices we make. Our nation and clients are increasingly diverse. And I hope that your generation will be the last without a completely diverse profession. Our profession needs to value diversity as we value our ethical standards. Society really can't afford to wait any longer. Our profession is at stake. We can't afford to wait any longer. While you face tough choices every day, someday you will face the most difficult of choices. You are ready. One of my heroes, Charles Weltner, was a very popular congressman from Georgia, the only congressman from the Deep South to vote in favor of the Civil Rights Act. Weltner came by his convictions even though his great-grandfather wrote the Confederate Constitution and died for the South of Fredericksburg. In 1966, all of the candidates in this one-party state were required to sign a loyalty oath pledging to support the entire Democratic ticket. Weltner signed it, and then a long shot candidate for governor was nominated, a man who chose to close his business rather than integrate it. Weltner was tested. In killing his own political career, Weltner dropped out of the race for re-election, one that he was surely going to win, saying his deepest convictions and beliefs were at stake. He could not violate the oath he took, yet he could not violate his principles and support this governor. In doing this, Weltner knew his political career was over, and indeed it was. Today, lawyers in China are required to sign oaths to the Communist Party over their clients. As American lawyers, we find these oaths repugnant to be sure our history of our profession is a rich one. The founders of this country recognized the need for an independent judiciary. In no other system of government have the law and the courts played so large a role. In no other country have lawyers been so influential and for good reason. Elsewhere, the symbol of society is a political party or a crown. In the United States, it's a document under glass with the National Archives or Constitution. The law is vital. Some say it transmits our culture. And now you have the privilege to uphold it. We choose to take that oath proudly. So what will be your good moment of choice to do something great? It will come. And while our profession is a pretty good one for making a dollar, it's also the best profession I know for making a difference, which is a lot harder and worth every effort. When faced with your choice, think of lawyers like Charlie Weltner and the lawyers in Pakistan who took to the streets when the president fired the independent judiciary, or the blind Chinese lawyer who speaks out for freedom. So dream big as you usher in the generation that follows you here and come back to tell about your big moment of choice and tell them how proud you are to have had an education here, how much it means to you, because I know how much it means to me. Why did I begin with the report of the Georgia Bar denying admission to women? 
because I hope this did indeed become an inspirational talk about why these are the good old days. And while the motion to admit women failed by a vote of two to one, I won my contested race to be a state bar officer by the same margin 82 years later. Because you have a unique opportunity to do what's right, to help others, to make a difference, to give back to your profession, to make a good choice, and have a full and fulfilling career. So I want to thank President Riccio, the Board of Trustees, the Trustees Emeritus, and especially to Dean Grunwald for leading our school so masterfully. And thank you to the families and the friends who supported these bright new lawyers on their journey to their happy day. And like you, I'm proud of every one of them. And to you, the class of 2012, as you embark on this great journey and begin to make your choices, the future is indeed ahead of you, and it's a bright one. Welcome to the community. It's our privilege to be Washington and Lee lawyers. Thank you. to keep the rain uh, on you for longer than necessary. Uh, I now uh, call to the platform Kristen and Queen, President of the Third Year Class, and Danny Isaac Smith, Vice President of the Third Year Class, to present a walking stick to Ms. Klein. Well, after hearing Ms. Klein talk about looking the part, I'm suddenly regretting my shoe choice, but hopefully ladies still forgive us today. <laughs> so we just want to say that on behalf of the class of 2012, we're so grateful for your time and your wisdom, and this is a small token of our appreciation. Everyone, please join me in once again thanking Ms. Klein for being here. I think our graduates do look the part. Thank you very much for holding up through the rain. I just have three very quick things to, to say to bring us to the German. First of all, the lunch that was scheduled to be outside is not surprisingly moved to the pavilion. So uh, first, I hope you will join us for lunch up there. Secondly, this is the time when I um, normally, at more length than I'm going to today, thank the faculty and the administration and the staff on behalf of the graduates for an excellent senior period and for all the work that we have done to make this day possible. But I do want to especially thank the facilities management group today, as well as the event planners who, in more ways than you will ever realize, tried to make arrangements to make this day possible in the event of something like rain. So please join me in thanking them as well. And many, many others. As I look to my right, I see the, the quintet, I see the signers who have endured throughout this room. So thank you again, all of you, for making this day possible. And finally, remember, graduates, that at Washington and Lee, what we say here is that we don't educate lawyers. We educate a particular kind of lawyer. And please, as you go out in the profession, heed the words of what Linda Klein has said, that you're carrying a special responsibility not only to the profession, but in my eyes, and not only to your law school, but to this university as well. We stand for something, and we hope that you will bring distinction to this university as well as to the profession. My congratulations, and we are adjourned. Thank you all very much.